Hello, this is Dr. Grande. Today's question is, can I analyze the case of Samantha Azopardi? Just a reminder, I'm not diagnosing anybody in this video, only speculating about what could be happening in a situation like this. If you enjoyed this video, please like it, subscribe to my channel, and consider supporting me on Patreon. I will put the link to Patreon in the description for this video. First, I will look at the background of this case, including the timeline of the crimes, then offer my analysis. Samantha Azopardi was born in Campbelltown, Australia, on August 21, 1988. This is a suburb of Sydney. Over the course of several years, Samantha used over 40 aliases and allegedly committed various offenses in Australia, Ireland, and Canada. Many of her offenses were related to dishonesty. I will go through some of her criminal history, but by no means is this a complete list of her alleged offenses. In November 2007, when Samantha was 19, she found herself in some trouble in Rockhampton, Australia. She pretended to be the actress Dakota Johnson, which resulted in her being arrested and charged with intent to defraud. In 2010, Samantha claimed that she was a 14-year-old in need of housing. She was convicted of forging documents and false representation. In 2011, Samantha pretended to be a 16-year-old gymnast from Russia, she said that her entire family had been killed when they were in France. In October of 2013, Samantha was in Dublin, Ireland. She was found wandering outside of a post office, pretending that she was unable to speak English. She was taken to a hospital where she used hand signals to indicate that she was 14 years old. The staff assumed that she was a victim of sex trafficking. The police figured out who Samantha actually was, but there were various opinions about how to handle her case. Some of the officers noted that Samantha didn't technically make a false report other than indicating that she was 14 years old. Lying about one's age typically is not a crime. Ultimately, she was given a mental health assessment and sent back to Australia. At some point in 2014, Samantha made contact with an American hiker who was in Sydney she told the hiker that she was a member of the Swedish royal family and that she had been kidnapped when she was younger. In September of 2014, Samantha made her way to Calgary, Canada, where she visited a medical facility and pretended she could not speak English. Using other forms of communication, 26-year-old Samantha convinced the staff there that she was a 14-year-old named Aurora Hepburn and was the victim of terrible mistreatment. The police vigorously investigated the case. They spent about $150,000. When they figured out who Samantha actually was, she was charged with public mischief. In December, she was sentenced to two months in jail. She had already been in jail for two months. Therefore, she was deported to Australia a week after being sentenced. In 2016, Samantha pretended to be a 13-year-old named Harper Hart. Using this identity, she enrolled in a school in a suburb of Sydney. She wasn't arrested for this until June of 2017. Samantha was charged with dishonestly obtaining financial advantage by deception. She was sentenced to a year in prison after pleading guilty. In February of 2019, Samantha pretended to be a talent scout named Marley. One report used the term modeling talent scout, a term which is controversial because it implies that modeling is a talent. Either way, Samantha managed to trick several people. She became friends with a 12-year-old girl and told her that she could get her a job as a voiceover artist for Pixar. Samantha and the girl traveled to Sydney for an audition, but of course there was no audition. Samantha convinced the girl to perform a series of bizarre tasks, including going to a government agency and giving them a note indicating she was seeing ghosts. In October of 2019, 31-year-old Samantha pretended to be 18 years old, which was older than her usual claim. She became friends with a French couple who lived in Melbourne, Australia. The couple had only been there for a short time. Samantha used a fake resume to become a nanny for the couple's two young children. In November, she informed the couple that she was going to take the children on a picnic. At this time, one child was four years old and the other 10 months old. Instead of going on a picnic, Samantha drove about two hours away to the city of Bendigo. 
she entered a mental health facility dressed in a school uniform and pretended that she was 14 years old. She indicated she was pregnant and her uncle had mistreated her. She even arranged for an unknown man to call the facility and pretend to be her father. The police caught up with her at a department store. She was arrested and charged with theft and child stealing. Samantha pleaded guilty and was sentenced to two years in prison. She was released in May of 2021, only to be arrested later that same year after pretending to be a 14-year-old French girl. This criminal charge was an important milestone for Samantha. It was the 100th time she had been charged with an offense in Australia. I can imagine a situation where Samantha is becoming frustrated as she fills out the criminal history section of a job application. She walks over to the employer and says, I need more time to complete this section. How long are you going to be here? The employer responds, at least for another hour. Samantha says, I kind of met in the long run. Like, how many years do you plan on working here? Now, moving to my analysis. Samantha Azopardi has been diagnosed with borderline personality disorder and schizophrenia. These diagnoses are curious considering the available information. In looking at borderline, this disorder often expresses in the context of romantic relationships, yet there is no mention of Samantha having a love-hate romantic relationship or a fear of abandonment. As far as schizophrenia, no information has been presented supporting the idea that Samantha has hallucinations or delusions. Now, of course, the mental health clinicians who generated these diagnoses had access to Samantha and therefore had information not available to the public. It's reasonable to believe they observed something consistent with these two disorders. Borderline personality disorder specifically has an association with pathological lying, which brings me to the next point. In addition to borderline personality disorder and schizophrenia, mental health clinicians indicated that Samantha suffers from pseudologia fantastica, which is otherwise known as pathological lying. The terms are used interchangeably, but it's worth noting that some researchers argue that pseudologia fantastica is an extreme subtype of pathological lying. A person cannot be officially diagnosed with pathological lying as it is a condition and not a disorder. Some researchers have argued that this doesn't make a lot of sense because an individual who lies about having an illness can be diagnosed with factitious disorder, but a person promoting non-illness deception cannot be diagnosed with that disorder. I think one problem is that pathological lying has not been a topic of a lot of research. Therefore, there has been reluctance to attach this behavior to a disorder. This brings me to the question, what is pathological lying? To answer this question, I will first compare it to normal lying or socially accepted lying. Deception is a common behavior for human beings. Most lies are designed to make interactions easier. For example, many people lie in order to be altruistic or tactful in social situations. They want to spare the feelings of other people. Pathological lying is quite a bit different than normal lying. It involves chronic and excessive lying that can appear to be driven by a lack of self-control. The condition usually expresses as a trait rather than being episodic. So it's not like the person lies for a few months, then they stop lying only to return to deceptive behavior later. Typically, once they start lying, they continue for life. Just like a personality trait, the deceptive tendency does not tend to change. One interesting feature of pathological lying is that the individual with the condition constructs false statements that are somewhat believable, at least initially. They are not making statements which are obviously bizarre or absurd in nature. For example, the person is not making claims like, I was born on another planet, the government is controlling my mind with satellites, or Meghan Markle is a talented actress. Again, statements that anyone would immediately recognize as untrue. Instead, the person with a condition constructs lies which have a reasonable probability of deceiving people for a short time. The lies often involve fantastical elements, but they are presented so convincingly that people will initially believe them. The motive for the deceptive behavior is not external gain. For example, there is no monetary benefit or attempt to escape punishment. The person is trying to obtain some type of internal gratification through constructing an imaginary adventure. Typically, the narrative places the person 
as a hero or a victim. But either way, the stories are designed to focus attention on the individual. It's almost like a daydream communicated as reality, as if they are trying to force their fantasies into becoming true. If they only say it, people will believe it, and somehow it will become real. One popular question that continues to be debated on the topic of pathological lying is this. Is pathological lying a deliberate behavior? Another way to think of this question would be, is the behavior conscious or unconscious? Some researchers believe that the lying occurs because the individual loses the ability to distinguish fantasy from reality. Therefore, the person is delusional. They have fixed false beliefs. The other school of thought says that pathological lying is an extreme form of cluster B personality pathology. This is supported by the fact that many people who demonstrate pathological lying have a diagnosis for at least one of the cluster B disorders. So antisocial, narcissistic, borderline, or histrionic personality disorder. Again, in this case, Samantha was diagnosed with borderline personality disorder. One could make a good argument that the elements from both schools of thought explain pathological lying. There is both a degree of fantasy and a degree of intentionality. Moving to the demographic characteristics of those suffering from pathological lying, the average age of onset for the condition is 16. 20% of the people with the condition have a history of mental health hospitalization. 50% of the people have a history of low-level crimes, like forgery, theft, and plagiarism. 30% grew up in a chaotic environment. The intelligence of people with the condition is average or above average. There have been many cases where the individual was exceptionally intelligent. Moving back to the case of Samantha Azopardi, the deception that she promoted placed her both as a hero and as a victim at different times. For example, she was a talent scout on one occasion, but on other occasions, she was a victim of horrible offenses. Regardless of which story she was using, Samantha has been described as interesting, captivating, and a pleasure to speak with. These qualities enhance her ability to manipulate people. The last time Samantha was arrested, she admitted that she was ill and needed help. Yet there is the sense that when she is released, she will once again enter an age loss program, so to speak, and cause a dramatic scene. The criminal justice system in Australia has struggled with Samantha's case. What should they do in response to her crimes? She has been charged 100 times and will probably come back for more. Some people believe that she should be incarcerated indefinitely. Others believe that her crimes are low level and should be tolerated. Clearly, she is mentally ill and does not desire to hurt people. I don't think there is an easy answer in this case. If Samantha's only offense was telling people she was under 18, I think that problem will remedy itself over time. I doubt that she's going to be able to pass as 14 years old when she reaches her 40s, 50s, and 60s. The difficulty is that Samantha has done more than just lie about her age. She has transported children under false pretenses, stolen money, and wasted law enforcement resources by making them investigate her false claims. Perhaps a long stay at a mental health facility would be the best compromise. I don't think she needs to be in prison, but she also shouldn't be free to harass society. Those are my thoughts on the case of Samantha Azopardi. Please put any opinions and thoughts in the comment section. They always generate an interesting dialogue. As always, I hope you found my analysis of this topic to be as intriguing as the world's longest job application. Thanks for watching.